If you have any investments that track the emerging markets indexes, it is better to understand China's stock market. And in this video, we'll share with you the story of China's stock market. How is it fundamentally different from the developed financial systems? And what's behind the past bull and bear markets? The Foundation of China's Stock Market Gan Zhu Ming was a former Chinese Communist Party committee member at the People's Bank of China, China's central bank. He recalled that during a meeting in 1988 with the then mayor of Shanghai, Zhu Ranji, his advice to Zhu was, quote, If you raise capital by issuing stocks, the principal doesn't have to be repaid. You'll just need to pay some dividends. Zhu was very fond of the idea of not needing to repay the principal. At the time, CCP's state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, had been expanding at a fast pace. But the inefficiencies led to losses and liquidity issues. Therefore, Zhu convinced the then CCP leader, Deng Xiaoping, to approve the Shanghai Stock Exchange. And in late 1990, the CCP opened both the Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. It seemed the main practical reason the stock market exists has been that, unlike bank loans and bonds, there is no required principal repayment on stocks. For the CCP, it would be a great way to help keep the large and inefficient SOEs afloat, and the investor's interest hasn't been a priority. So how has the CCP been running the stock markets? Fabricating financials to go public. In October 1992, the CCP established the Securities Commission under the State Council. Zhu Ranji, who was promoted to the Vice Premier of China, was the Commission's director. In 1993, China's inflation was rising. Beijing was forced to tighten the money supply, which caused severe liquidity issues among the SOEs. After 2 trillion yuan spent on direct funding, subsidized loans, and converting debt to stock, the problem was not resolved. Then the CCP directed the SOEs to raise capital through the stock market. And from 1992 to 1994, the number of publicly traded companies increased from 53 to 291. The flood of supply drove the Shanghai Stock Index down from around 1,000 points in December 1993 to below 400 points in July 1994. To stop the bearish trend, on July 30, 1994, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, or CSRC, announced three measures to save the stock market including pausing new stock issuance and initial public offerings, controlling the size of offerings, and allowing the creation of more investment funds. After the policy came out, the Shanghai Stock Index rose 30% in one day on August 1st, and by September, the index had tripled. This was the first time the central government intervened to stabilize the stock market. But in 1994, about 40% of SOEs were still running at a loss. In 1996, more large SOEs started to go public, and to meet requirements, many of them had to fabricate financial statements. Since then, market interventions and fabricated financials have become notable features of China's stock market. Earlier this year, Luck & Coffee was found fabricating sales to raise money in the U.S., but this behavior was not rare in China. Covering 600 billion of non-performing assets in 1998, Zhu Ranji became the premier of China. As for the stock market, his policy was that, quote, the stock market should serve to provide relief to state-owned enterprises and to expand the joint stock system. On May 16, 1999, Beijing approved the six suggestions for further regulating and advancing the development of securities market. The policies include loosened rules for securities firms and expanding investment funds. This led to the so-called May 19th bull market. On June 10th, the central bank lowered interest rates for the seventh time since 1996. On June 15th, state media, People's Daily, quoted CSRC Vice President Chen Shan, commented that the bull market was just a recovery, which further pushed the market higher. On the 22nd, the president of the CSRC made another comment encouraging the public to invest in stocks. Less than three years ago, he warned people about market risks and discouraged speculations. By June 2001, the Shanghai Stock Index reached 2,245 points. The bull market did provide the CCP with some financial relief. Between 1999 and 2001, stock trading profits helped hundreds of securities firms cover about 600 billion yuan of non-performing assets. In August, 
China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, one of China's largest companies, completed its IPO at 4.22 yuan per share. After 20 years, its share price is around 4 yuan at present. The bull market was largely backed by the CCP's policies and the investors' faith in the central government. The stock valuations measured by the price-earnings ratio were very high. But the companies that raised capital did not materially improve their performances. The loss of trust in the government led to a bear market for the next five years. By June 2005, the Shanghai Stock Index had dropped to 998 points. Because Zhu Ranji had led many of the interventions, some in the field came up with a joke quote, It's not a bull market. It's not a bear market. It's a Jew market. Playing Tricks on Investors In May 2005, the CCP started trials to reform the SOE's ownership structures. At the time, stocks in the SOEs were divided into two categories. The majority stake owned by the CCP, or those backed by it was legally barred from circulation. As a result, the SOE's managers did not have to care about how their decisions would affect the prices of the publicly traded shares owned by investors. In the long term, this conflict of interest was not good for investor confidence. But changing the rule alone would dramatically increase the supply of stocks in circulation and drive down the prices. Therefore, starting June 2005, the CCP announced a series of policies to increase the demand. These included increased holdings by the state-backed shareholders, lowering the trading-related taxes, and approval of more new investment funds. The then governor of the People's Bank of China, Zhou Xiaotran, personally encouraged speculation by stating, quote, there are risks with buying stocks, but there are even higher risks with not buying stocks. And the bull market started at the end of that year. In 2006, the stock market was up 130%. By the end of 2007, the combined value in Shanghai and Shenzhen's markets reached 30 trillion yuan, 10 times what it was just two years ago. The number of stock trading accounts increased from 2005 77 million to 2007's 138 million. This created an excellent opportunity for the CCP and its SOEs to cash out. By June 2008, at least 12 large SOEs went public. Each represented over 1% of the entire market. Many existing public companies started to sell additional shares. For example, Citic Group, the state-backed shareholder of Citic Securities, sold 3.6 billion yuan worth of shares. The Shanghai Stock Index reached its peak of 6,124 on October 16, 2007. To prevent the market from overheating, Beijing raised interest rates six times and bank reserve requirements ten times in 2007 alone. The actions to suppress the bubble, the oversupply of stocks, and the global financial crisis together caused the market to crash. By October 28, 2008, the index had plunged to 1,664 points losing 72.8%. On November 11th, Beijing had to announce a 4 trillion yuan stimulus package. The market was up over 7% immediately, but the effect of the stimulus didn't last very long. The Shanghai Stock Index only recovered to around 3,500 points by August 2009. Then it started going down again until 2014. As the then president of the CSRC, Gyo Xu Qing, commented in 2012, the days of cashing out of the stock market by treating investors as fools have gone. We can imagine how bad the market was when the CCP's top financial regulator makes such a remark. But has the investors been fairly treated since then? The market turbulence that spread globally. By early 2014, the Shanghai Stock Index dropped to around 2,000 points. But the CCP's need to pump liquidity into its state-owned enterprises didn't change. Another policy-driven bull market was on the way. In September 2014, state media Xinhua Net published nine articles in three days to encourage the public to buy stocks. In November, Beijing opened up a new channel for foreign investors to invest in mainland China through Hong Kong. It also made new rules to limit the supply of new stocks by curbing the sizes and valuations. From a monetary perspective, Beijing lowered interest rates and bank reserve requirements and made it easier for people to speculate on the market with borrowed money. The stimulating policies turned out effective. By November 2014, China passed Japan and became the second largest stock market in the world. 
and the Shanghai Stock Index went all the way up to 5,178.19 by June 12, 2015. This time was no different when it comes to giving the state-backed shareholders a chance to cash out. According to official statistics, from the beginning of 2015 to July 9th, about 70 SOEs sold roughly 33 billion yuan's worth of stocks. Nevertheless, the bubble eventually burst as soon as the CCP tried to reduce the low-quality loans given to individual investors. The Shanghai Stock Index started to drop on Monday, June 15th. It was down to around 2,850.71 points by August 26th, losing 45% in about two and a half months. Fears in the market had spread worldwide. On August 24th, the U.S. stock suffered the biggest one-day fall since 2011. The CCP then tried every possible way to stop the losses. It assembled a so-called national team of securities firms to provide liquidity, arrested fund managers Xu Xiang and Li Jianlin for market manipulation and insider trading, and used the state media to maintain investor confidence. But the efforts didn't help much. By August 2018, China ceded the second largest stock market status back to Japan. And to date, the stock index has only recovered to about 3,200 points. The ultimate winner. The stock markets have their ups and downs, and we recognize that many skilled investors can make money in any type of market. But we need to realize that China's stock exchanges were not designed to embrace the free market. Instead, they have been the CCP's financing tool to save its corrupt and inefficient state-owned enterprises that control China's economy. And when the market isn't going in the direction it likes to see, the party has not been shy to use its state power to exert influence. The not always successful interventions have caused the markets to be driven by the policies rather than China's fundamental economic conditions. As Friedrich Hayek put it, economic control is the control of the means for all our ends, and whoever has control of the means must also determine which ends are to be served. The CCP understands that, so we wouldn't expect it to give up control of China's stock market the regime and its state-owned enterprises will continue to be the ultimate winners, and the average Chinese investors who put their faith in their government will continue to be those paying the prices. What's your opinion on China's stock market? Leave your comments below. Thank you for watching Unseen Fortunes. If you enjoyed our content, please click like, subscribe, and share. We'll see you next time.